What inspires a retired oil guy? Let's find out. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher and welcome to this week's episode of All About Books. If you love books, then stop right there because on my channel, I interview authors to find out the inspiration behind their stories. So for the latest author interviews, be sure and hit that subscribe button on the bottom of the screen. Today, I am so delighted to have a retired oil guy with us today. He is a poet, a photographer, a documentary filmmaker, energy and climate change columnist, Ross Below. Balot, sorry, Ross, excuse me. We'll be talking about his latest poetry collection, Moving to Climate Change Hours. It's published by Wallace, Walsack and Wynn. And I am so excited because Ross is my first poet on All About Books. Welcome, Ross. Hi, Crystal. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, I'm sorry I got your name wrong right after I promised I wouldn't. <laughs> um, you have written this incredible collection of poetry, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your collection, Ross. Well, um, the title is Moving to Climate Change Hours, which, um, as you might expect, has to do with the climate catastrophe we're living through. Mm -hmm. When uh, my publisher, Noel Allen, suggested the title, I thought, great, because several of the poems deal with that. But also, I think also the internal climate of me also changes mm -hmm. through the, the book as well. There's an arc, yes. I feel, to the, the poems as you read th through them. And um, I think also, as you mentioned, oil, oil worked in the oil industry for over three decades. And uh, uh, with some co internal conflict over that, given my concerns about the climate as well. So uh, it addresses that. But I think also there's a more general issue we all have uh, that the book's thinking about, that we all live in this fossil fuel powered uh, economy, way of life. And we all have that conflict. So I think it's not just my conflict. I think it's everyone's uh, as well. And the book deals with that. OK. Mm -hmm. And your, your, book, your book, it has over 50 poems. <laughs> so you are, you are obviously very busy. And when you're writing, Ross, do you have um, many poems on the go at one time, or do you start one and finish, finish it? No, many poems on the go. And like some of those poems in that book are at least 10 years old. Uh, I've oh. been working on them for 10 years. Uh, so it's not just, uh, yeah, some poems eventually are put aside as more or less finished, then they may come back. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a continual editing process it's hard to tell when something's done. Um, I mean, that's always a challenge. So yeah, the poems span, the writing of the poems span a very long length of time. Okay. And I was really interested um, in the way you formatted your, your poems, because I could almost, when I was reading them, you know, just the way your paragraphs swayed and moved back and forth. And actually I will show, just so readers know what I'm talking about here. Your poem on page 72, Tundra Swans. Yeah. See if people can see that. It just really felt to me like it was in the shape of the swan. And I'm not sure if that's the style. So I was wondering when you're writing, do you do you kind of go with the way the words are pouring out? Or how how do you always format them? Well, um, some of the advice I've had in the past is not to go to form too early. Okay. To allow the poem to find itself. And then uh, the form ends up suiting the material. Uh, yes. If you go too early, you may actually suppress material you're in, that the poem's interested in exploring. Mm. So um, often the poems don't find their form until the uh, late stages of writing. Okay. Or it may be tr um, often trying a bunch of different forms, which also generates more material until mm -hmm. the poem lands itself where it's trying to get to. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, and the book itself, as you're pointing out, there's a wide variety of forms yes. that are used. Um, somebody suggested uh, 
the biodiversity of the book in terms of poetry form is relating ah. the theme of the book around climate change uh, and okay. the issue of biodiversity. Oh, I love that. That's fantastic. Um, also, Ross, I was hoping that you could do a reading for us today. But before your reading, can you share with us the inspiration behind the particular poem that you're that you're reading? Sure. Um, I'll start with the first poem in the book, First Day. Yes. And um, it was, um, I guess it was, uh, in some ways, I've realized afterwards, it was an exploration of a trauma from quite a long time ago, set in 1979, that I had never really fully processed. Mm -hmm. So the writing of a poem brought up that. I mean, at the time, I just ground through things, just kept going. Yes. And the poem itself allowed me to take a, a look back and appreciate uh, really the immense tragedy that shows up in the poem. Right. Uh, you want me to go? Please, yeah. First day, Gulf Oil Refinery, Clarkson, Ontario, 1979. Two men blinded by hydrofluoric acid yesterday. The skin of one absorbed acid and it ate his bones. He died this morning. The gate's safety sign says 12 hours work since the last lost time. The safety trainer lectures. Hydrogen sulfide. At high concentrations, it causes olfactory paralysis. You can't smell it. Then you fall down unconscious, and next you die. If you see a body on the ground, you must check wind direction, move upwind, call for help. Imagine your best friend Bill on the ground, how it would feel to leave him. This is your first day. Wear work boots, learn work rules, get the paycheck, Go home to Shelley, pregnant with Neil, looking after little Heather. Do the right thing. Be a good boy. Come home safe 10,000 more times. Wow. <laughs> yeah, you know, after, after I read that, that poem, Ross, I just, it, it stopped me. I stopped reading and just really digested it it's it's incredibly powerful as so many of your poems are thank you you're welcome you're welcome um in 2016 you were a finalist in cbc's poetry con com contest and in 2020 you were long listed and in 2018 it, oh 2018 excuse me in an interview with cbc saskatchewan weekend you said and this really stuck with me one of the wonderful things about poetry is your delving down into darkness. Poetry is an attempt to say the unsayable. You're delving into the unconscious of feelings and spirit. There's a reason people put poems on their fridge. It speaks to them in a way a novel doesn't. And I just thought that was so fantastic. And I, I, I would just love you, for you to expand upon even more of that connection with poetry that people have to it. Uh, yes, uh, as you know, the, the thing, as I said, poetry is attempt, often is attempting to say things we don't have language for. Yeah. So we use uh, poetic devices in order because the words don't quite match. Uh, what, what we were trying to evoke in the reader or ourselves. So, um, you know, the use of poetic devices like alliteration, assonance, the sounds within the poem are very important. Uh, the line breaks, the formatting, as we said, all have an effect beyond just the words on the page, the shape of the poem, the uh, white space of the poem, the things that aren't there that you might expect to be there that you hear anyway. Um, you know, there's a form called erasure where people take things out, but you still can still feel uh, the words that were gone. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, as an art form, that's the thing about poetry. It is uh, doing things in many 
ways, both visually and orally. And, and when they say orally, I mean A-U-R, uh, the sounds, um, as well as the images and metaphors that you're using within the poems, um, the repetition, et cetera, the musicality of the poem. So there's a, there's a lot uh, underneath these short, very often very short uh, pieces of uh, writing um, that have an effect beyond what you'd expect from the individual words you see on the page. And for you as a poet, have you found the process to be very therapeutic? Yes, and I, I mentioned, you know, delving into the unconscious. I, mm -hmm. I really believe um, in the act of writing poetry, we're letting go. If you, often, if you have an idea, an idea, and you start writing about it, the poem goes somewhere else. Your idea was completely wrong. It was a way to seed the work. Um, and you're allowing the unconscious to take over the material that shows up that, you know, they often say, look for the hot spot in the poem when you're writing it. Um, the material that shows up is often completely unexpected and coming from somewhere else. And that is the best. I mean, you get <laughs> yeah. something, you go somewhere you never expected and you look at it after several iterations, you go, wow, I had no idea that was what I was going to write. <laughs> Do you find, does inspiration, that creative muse, strike you at all times, or? No. Um, I think often, um, I mean, there's a use of poetic prompts is quite, uh, quite common with uh, poets. So, you know, uh, something to seed the work to get that process going I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, on the other hand, yeah, there's times there's something specific or a word strikes you or something yeah. that just triggers the need to write and the material that flows from that. Uh, but I don't think, uh, I think I'd have a problem if I just waited and sitting waiting for inspiration. <laughs> I know that right. occasionally that happens, but often it's hard work to dig out, um, you know, the material. Okay. Do you, do you ever see yourself writing a novel? I have, um, I started creative writing 20 years ago at a, a McMaster Continuing Ed um, Certificate of Creative Writing. And I started with short fiction. Yeah. And I really enjoyed that. And at, the, at one point I started trying to write a novel, but it ended up being a short story. I, I just couldn't. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I discovered poetry. It turns out uh, the compression of poetry seems to be where I need to be. So, um, you know, I don't think a novel's in the cards for me um, because, as I say, uh, for the material I explore and the way I write, it seems I need that compression. Um, I, I know things may change, but that's currently where, where I am. Where you're at? Okay. Um, and could you read another poem as well Ross sure and again if you could tell us the, the the inspiration behind it that would be fantastic all right let's see okay um the next poem is set uh both in uh, on the west coast so in Eugene Oregon as well as in Banff um, and there's something about water in the poem that ties those two places together. Um, it was originally, I was reading uh, ba Robert Hass's uh, poem, uh, Meditation at Lag Lagunitas. And this poem, while it doesn't exactly emulate Bob's poem, it seems almost, for me, it was a response to it. So, mm -hmm. um, and Bob's poem, you know, I'm not anywhere close to what he writes, but um, I, I, that was my starting point for it. So this idea of trying to explore a meditation while also exploring a place with people in it, I guess. Um, okay. At a slough in Eugene, Sarah and I stand above Amazon Creek's oil slow waters. Early evening shadows side by each. Companions motioning. Reflected voices all blurred blood rushing towards blood silence. And erasure. I understand nothing. 
memories, longing, purposelessness. There once was a woman cliff edge at Bow Falls, wondering how I got there. Rapids far below a story I hadn't ever heard. I didn't enjoy heights. Her sure-footedness convinced me a magpie once walked through her body and saved her. My foot slipped as twilight entered my body. I accept safety as desire only when there is nothing left and everything is in relationship to failing. Each day brings its own light, which cannot be owned. She may have felt that way too, but in that it is all like yesterday, cold stone, unclimbed mountains where language fails completely. Blueness all up under is chanting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, of all your poems, Ross, do you have one that just st sticks st closest to your heart? Well, you know, I think um, when you asked that question, what came up was Lac Megantic. Um, you know, uh, being in the oil business and actually having had something to do with crude by rail for a while, uh, that disaster really, um, a tragic disaster. I mean, all disasters are tragic, but that in particular, I mean, uh, yeah. people that were killed that had absolutely nothing to do with what happened to them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's all around the oil business. So I think that one in particular resonates with me and my conflict around where I worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now, um, you're currently doing some really interesting work with um, with video, and you're doing. Yeah, I. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, can you can you tell uh, the reader our readers about it? Yeah, I was. Um, I applied for a Canada Council grant my first time, uh, and I proposed something that, in retrospect, was a little crazy. Uh, <laughs> I, I proposed it partly because. I didn't know how hard it was going to be, but also partly I didn't really expect to get the grant. So uh, <laughs> the proposal was uh, to take a selection, uh, selected poems from the book and make a video for each one, one a week for three months. Mm -hmm. um, and it turned out, I had no idea what that would entail. And each one <laughs> takes about 20 hours. So it was, it was a lot of work as it turned out. <laughs> I just finished the 12th one. So I'm resting a bit before I compile them all into one. Uh, I want to make a compilation video as well, but um, really a great experience. And also uh, with them, I wrote a blog that exposes the, or exposes as well as explores the poetics of, uh, of each poem and also choices made in making the video. So it was, uh, I learned a lot, uh, both technically as well as about my own poetry, taking another, you know, uh, sort of objective look at it. Uh, a long time after the poems were written. Okay. So I will put links down below in the description box so readers can go to your website and view some of these incredible videos. And I highly encourage um, everyone to do so because to see the imagery combined with your um, voice, it's such a great way to experience poetry. Great. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. So this is keeping you busy. Are you also having any time to write in it right now? Like, what are you currently working on? Um, last year, prior to COVID, uh, I took a um, uh, couple month journey uh, to the West Coast through the US, mostly, well, all, all US, actually. And uh, I kept a journal on the way out. I have um, and in particular, a friend of mine, Sarah, who's in that last poem, she and I went down into High and Palm, California, which is in like the, the least populated part of California in the mountains. We spent 10 days there. And I, I have a, a project I'm working on called High and Palm. Um, and uh, it's going to be a lot. So far, it looks like it's some kind of long poem. There's a lot of material coming in from the history of the area, the gold rush, um, what really quite terrible things that happened to the native peoples as people moved into the area and then the, what it's like currently. Um, so that's the, that's the main thing I'm working on now as well as um, Sarah and I 
I, my friend, are also working on a translation of uh, uh, a 19, an, an early 20th century sur a French surrealist. Um, so we're working on translating one of his books. Um, that's that's it was a great COVID activity actually. Was, uh, <laughs> um, um, stuck inside. Um, yeah. Great to find something new to really dig into. So mm -hmm. that would be the other major thing I've been working on, which kind of went on hold with the the um, the video project. So I, I'm just about to get back to that. Oh, good for you. Well, we wish we wish you luck with that. And uh, thank you so much, Ross, for coming on today and chatting with us about your incredible book right here, Moving to uh, Climate Change Hours. Again, I'll put links down below to Ross's website so you can learn more about Ross um, and also purchase a copy of his novel. For everyone else, oh, no, I'm having trouble with talking today, his wonderful poetry collection. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ross. And really, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And come back next week, everyone, because I will have another author and another behind the stories. Thank you.